to the ancient world, the blue stone lapis lazuli was considered sacred. This man, Gary Bowersox, has explored Afghanistan in search of the source of the precious blue stone. He's traveled the same roads as some of the most famous figures from history, such as Alexander the Great. This is the story of one man's endeavor, sneaking over borders and crossing the roof of the world to reach the oldest mine on Earth. The mine is 7,000 years old, and it is still worked by hand today. From this remote mine came the lapis lazuli to decorate death masks and the most precious items of the ancient Egyptians. Events in this film took place before the tragedy of September the 11th. Gary first came to the city of Peshawar in Pakistan in the 70s. His goal was to buy gemstones for his business back in the USA. Gems are traded in Namak Mandi, the ancient salt market. Jewels and almost everything else have been bought and sold here for as long as anyone can remember. Gary has come to love this place and its people over the 30 years he's been returning. Gary returns each year to visit the many friends he's made and to buy more gemstones. In Namakmandi, business is still conducted discreetly and in a time-honored way. Behind closed doors, there are many different gems to be viewed and bought. We do have some ones up. Wow, these are nice. Look at this. But you know I'm also interested in ruby. Mm -hmm. You have any ruby? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm interested in that. I think we'll get that. But what about the price? $1, One lakh? Ah, uh, you know. <laughs> Here. You guys <laughs> talking about yourself, you know? Things are done differently in this part of Asia. What do you think? The scarf is used to hide hands and fingers that send coded signals about the price. He says, I have struggled very hard. Uh, to get this material, uh -huh. so... I'll start playing. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you some discount, but uh, you <laughs> give me a good offer. Yeah. 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 What's, what's his best price? price? He says you are my good friend. Yeah, that cost me. Last price. Well, if you can't decide, I know it's a problem. Let's no, let's just close it up and no we'll settle tomorrow. I, I can see you're not settling this at all, so we'll uh, we'll work on this later. On the same street are hidden a series of underground rooms, at the end of which lies an Aladdin's cave, full of the most ancient of gemstones. The gold in a pharaoh's death mask was just a matrix to hold the most precious stone then known, lapis lazuli. This cellar contains 18 tons of lapis lazuli an unimaginable fortune in ancient times, and even today, valued in millions of dollars. Lapis lazuli comes in different shades. The most valued is royal blue. Wetting the raw stone brings out the color 
and gives an idea of how the polished gem will look. When Gary buys the rich blue stone to make rings and necklaces, he continues an age-old tradition. The first use of lapis was as jewelry. Lapis beads have been found in graves over 5,000 years old. The ancient Egyptians knew only that the stone came from far away to the east. Through his travels, Gary has learned that the mine of the pharaohs lies in Afghanistan and that the journey is a dangerous one. But working and living in Peshawar has its own perils. Over the years that Gary's been coming to Peshawar, he's witnessed riots and bombings and been kept awake by gunfire. Gary came to depend on Green's Hotel as his safety zone. He even had his room, room 101, conveniently close to the lobby and the British Airways office. But in 1986, this office was blown up. Too close for comfort, time to move. Gary finished his business and left town the next day. Greens can be delightful when bombs are not going off. And one of the nicest parts is this restaurant, Lala's. However, all is not what it seems. Lala's has long been the meeting place of spies plying their dark trade in this troubled region. Today, Gary is meeting with his old friend and guide, Kudai Nazar Akbari. Not sick anymore? No. She's good now. She's better. Gary can remember the bad old days when Russia invaded Afghanistan. Then a table by the window was only for the naive. Bullets often ripped in from the street. Quite enough to give the nervous indigestion. The restaurant of the spies is not the place to discuss the trip to Afghanistan. Time to retreat to Gary's room. Yeah. And what about the Lorai Pass? Has there been any storms there or anything? No. So we're going to get through no, there and get to Chitral with no problem. Kudai and Gary have worked together for the last eight years. Have they cleared the landmines here? Yeah, or is it no, still, no landmines. Still more than three million landmines so in that area. They ventured into Afghanistan yeah, before and know the dangers well. Yeah, yeah. And, and then go north. After a few hours sleep, Gary and Kudai look for a bus to take them north, the start of the journey to the mines of the pharaohs. The brightly painted buses only ply the streets of Peshawar. What Gary and Kudai need for the journey to Chitral is a plain but reliable minibus. The normal route into Afghanistan, the Khyber Pass, is not safe. For in July 2001, the Taliban control that part of the country. So the journey is north, parallel to the border, over the Lara Pass, and on to Chitral. Journeys always start with doubts and questions. Why has Gary returned to this dusty, alien world? The plan is to go to Afghanistan to help friends there, the miners and traders. But how many will still be alive? Will Gary and Kudai be able to get across the border? But first, they have to survive the journey to Chitral. soon climbs into the mountains and deteriorates. 
Only in the summer months is the road passable, and even then, there can be trouble, like a sudden thunderstorm. Rain high up in the mountains is worrying. Streams swell into torrents that can sweep away the road and anything on it. Sure enough, just below the highest point, the Lara Pass, the road has been washed away. Once they're over the pass, Gary and Kudai have another six hours of dusty, twisting roads. Plenty of time to worry about the next stage, the border crossing into Afghanistan. Finally, they arrive in Chitral. What a miserable long day. 17 hours from Peshawar to Chitral, up over that lorry pass, 10,400. 42 switchbacks. Then a minibus has to break down, the road washes out, We've got to pull the stinking thing out of the ditch. We're lucky to be here, but actually worse is coming now. We have to figure out how we're going to get across that border and into Afghanistan and up those mountains. The news in Chitral is not good. The border on the Pakistan side has six guard posts. All will have to be crossed discreetly and in the dark. So while Kudai finds out more about the guard posts, Gary checks out Chitral. Chitral has been a strategic town for centuries, controlling one of the oldest trade routes from Asia to Europe. The many different faces in the bazaar, Tajiks, Mongols, Pashtuns and Caucasians, are evidence of the great movements of people that have swept through here over the centuries. One such, the Kalash people, live nearby in the valleys that border Afghanistan. They have their own distinct customs and religion. As they're not Muslim, the women do not cover their faces. The women's dance celebrates the changing seasons. The Kalasha claim descent from Alexander the Great, who crossed the Hindu Kush over 2,000 years ago. Their looks and distinct dress hint at a southern European connection. And it may well be true. Alexander's march eastward took many years, and his older troops retired on the way. Could some of Alexander's men have stayed in the mountains and married local women? Studying the women, you could convince yourself that they looked Mediterranean. If so, then the bones of the Kalasha ancestors, exposed in their traditional burial boxes, contain the genes of the men of Alexander's army. After three days chilling out in Chitral, suddenly it's time to pack. The police have heard of Gary's plan to cross the border. It's time to leave town. Kudai disguises the Western luggage in local sacks, and they're hidden under boxes. Kudai will travel with the luggage, leaving Gary to meet him at the border. Well, there goes Kudai in the bags. Now comes the tricky part. Pakistan doesn't really like us crossing this border, even though we have legal visas. So the plan is that Kudai will take the bags and check out all the guard posts. If I have to, we'll have to run around one and we'll end up meeting at the border and get on the horses and go into Afghanistan. The road is full of potholes and it twists and turns as it climbs into the mountains. 
The journey to the border post at Shashadim takes six bone-jarring hours. It's a tense time as Gary and Kudai could get arrested and Gary deported. Whatever happens, if they're caught, the journey to the Lapis Mine will be over for this year. Things are not going to plan. There are too many guard posts, and Gary and Kudai run out of time. Last night ended up being a lot longer than we thought it was going to be. We had to run around three posts, and we ended up the light coming up about 5.30 this morning, and we had to stop because our driver got stopped by military, and they wouldn't allow anybody on the road until 6 a.m. So what happened was we ended up following a water channel across the mountain. So we continued to walk until the light came up, and then we found this room to stay in for the day, and we'll continue our journey tonight after it gets dark up over the door pass. But first, there are the last and most dangerous checkpoints. Local clothing, the shalwa kameez and a chitrali cap helps disguise the furtive figures. For here, Gary and Kudai have no alternatives. They have to sneak past the posts and hope the guards are not too watchful. The last and most difficult guard post is behind them. But Gary and Kudai have no time to relax. The border is five hours away at the top of the Dora Pass. There's a 5,000 foot climb before Gary and Kudai are truly safe. Horses, organized by Kudai, are quickly loaded and the long trek begins. <laughs> The climb will be a difficult one, up steep trails made more dangerous by the dark. On a previous expedition, Gary's horse slipped and fell on top of him. Both horse and man were lucky to escape without broken bones. The Dora Pass has always been an important trade route for silk and gemstones in the past and more recently for weapons for the forces fighting in Afghanistan. It's wise not to ask too many questions of fellow travelers in the night. At sunrise, Gary and Kudai are still struggling up the slope. Finally, Afghanistan. Behind me is Pakistan. This is the Dora Pass at 14,900 feet. Because of the border problems, we didn't get out of Shashadim till three this morning. We had a ride all night, tired, it's now cold, but we're now here in Afghanistan. After the long climb, the horses need a rest. But first, Gary and Kudai want to get a few yards between themselves and the border. Elated by being back in Afghanistan, and having the border behind them, and perhaps also a little high because of the extreme altitude, 
they begin to relax. For Kudai, this is a homecoming and a chance to see his family. Gary hopes to meet up with his old friend, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance. But right now, they need to find a place for the horses to rest. And while the horses relax and feed, Gary reflects on a past journey he made over the roof of the world. My first trip over Dora Pass was during the Soviet occupation. Matter of fact, I just found these bullets on the ground right here. It was a total war zone. Masood had a command post up here, right at the end of the lake. There was a Chaikana, which means tea house or place to stay. And the Soviets had their post at the other side of Topkana, which is the mountain in the distance there. When we got to the Chaikana, we found out that uh, it was a bad situation. We'd have to climb up over the top of it. You can see a little bit of the snow cap now but it was very snowy the time we did it. And uh, we had to start in the dark. And I was fortunate because when I got the top, I met an Afghan who had just been shot at and he showed me which route to go to avoid the angle of the Russian bullets. The Russians left 12 years ago, but Afghanistan remains a dangerous place. Of more immediate concern, the Chaikana at the end of the lake is deserted and Gary and Kudai have to hurry another 10 miles before they find a place to stay. The night is spent in an old Russian army tent. Over the years, its canvas walls must have sheltered a motley crew of gun runners and spies, all sneaking into Afghanistan. Today, things are a little calmer, at least here. The most important thing now is for Gary and Kudai to get fresh horses for the journey on to the mine. Hiring horses can be quite a performance. Doing a deal is a central part of Afghan life. It's taken seriously and cannot be hurried. Each horse has its owner, and each owner has to be heard. This could go on all day. I just sit and relax and let Kudai handle this thing. There's no use me getting into it. The journey for the next three days is over high passes and along remote valleys unmarked by roads to the village of Escaza. trail across the Hindu Kush, the killer of Hindus, is a real test of legs and lungs. The air is cold and thin and painfully short of oxygen. Occasionally, the path widens and is lined with white marble boulders. This is a part of the Silk Road, the great transcontinental trade route that stretched from Europe to China. Gary is traveling the same path that countless traders have walked for centuries. Little seems to have changed since unknown and unnamed traders crossed these mountains, carrying the sacred lapis to the pharaohs thousands of years ago. Over the centuries, there have been many other travelers. Marco Polo traveled through this region in 1272 on his incredible journey to China. 
he accompanied his father and uncle, both Venetian traders. They spent many years in the service of the great Mongol ruler, the Kublai Khan. Marco told of the gems hidden amongst these remote peaks. It is a fact that in the same country, in a mountain, are found the stones from which is made lapis lazuli, of the finest quality in the world. Even though he spent a year recuperating from an illness, Marco Polo never discovered the location of the lapis mine. Gary is a trader, an adventurer, like Marco Polo, and is literally traveling in his footsteps hundreds of years later. But he faces problems that Marco never had. The Russians have left a deadly legacy of landmines. The skeletons of unwary horses litter the sides of the trails. Whole mountainsides are lethal, and you don't leave the trail unless utterly compelled to. People have abandoned this region of Afghanistan. Even the Chaikanas are deserted, and there is little food to be found. After days of hardship, Gary and Kudai reach Eskaza. Even though the Russians bombed it to rubble, the people have slowly rebuilt the houses and their lives. The horses need some loving care and maintenance, and the local blacksmith sets about making some nails for their shoes. His craft is as essential and relevant today as it's always been in this remote corner of the world. New shoes and rest will help the horses. But Gary and Kudai are feeling the strain too. I'm really tired and we're filthy. Look at these clothes. We came from the Pakistan border, two 12-hour days, one 14-hour day. We walked until we had blisters on our feet and our legs were sore. Then we rode horses until we had blisters on our bottom. And then we reversed it and walked again. Then we rode again. But now we are here at Escarza, which is a crossroads in Afghanistan. Going north, we have Sarasang, the Lapis Mines. Going west, we have mines near Panjshir Valley. So what we're gonna do is probably leave the horses here. They're as exhausted as we are. But now, if you'll excuse me, I've gotta somehow figure out a way that I'm gonna get in this cold water and take a bath. The water is icy. Snow melt from the highest mountains, enough to make you go numb and blue in minutes. But as all the dust and sweat washes off, the feeling of cleanliness is indescribable. And after a bath in the river and a good night's sleep, it's time to move on. Escaza has catapulted Gary and Kudai into the 21st century. They can travel by pickup truck, but there's a road to the Panjshir. Well, a road of sorts, and a vehicle of sorts to match. They even have a couple of hitchhikers. There are a few problems with the highway to the Panjshir, and they soon become apparent at the first river crossing. This is a typical Afghan water trap. We just got across with our light vehicle when this fellow, knowing he'd break the bridge, went to go around and his engine went out in the water. This poor fellow is probably going to be here several hours now. Last year, I was stuck here for three hours because a larger truck tried to make it and broke the bridge. 
Apart from the water traps, the only other minor inconvenience is the slight unevenness of the road. The road passes Anjuman village. It's changed little since Alexander the Great's army marched through here 2,300 years ago. The battered and spluttering Toyota is struggling to repeat Alexander's heroic journey. To Alexander, the peaks of the Hindu Kush were the mountains at the edge of the world. They marked the end of the earth. In the Greek legends that Alexander had grown up with, Zeus had tortured Prometheus in these very mountains. Prometheus' sin had been to give humans the secret of fire and the arts of civilization. Alexander's goal was the conquest of the known world. He recruited men for his army wherever he went. Afghans joined the forces, and just as today, they must have been fearsome warriors. Alexander's army stretched for miles, and it may have taken 16 days to cross these mountains. Gary's concerns appear trivial compared to those of Alexander. The problem today is the Toyota and the driver. He gets more restless and difficult the further he is from home. Gary faces a wheezing diesel engine and a temperamental driver. Alexander had an army of thousands when he climbed these slopes. The Toyota gasps for air as it climbs towards the 15,000-foot Anjuman Pass. The Toyota doesn't like it. It's had a full life and now comes with a manual cooling system, which needs operating every half hour. The top of the pass. The landscape is completely barren, and the wind is icy cold. For once, Gary and the driver are in agreement. They have to get down to the Panchia Valley before nightfall. Nothing will stop them now. The Panchia Valley is vast. It stretches 70 miles and there are numerous side valleys and side valleys of side valleys. There are few entrances, and the place is a natural fortress. Gary has traveled here before, and Panchia brings back mixed emotions. He's seen Afghan friends killed by Russian bombs. This was the scene of some of the fiercest fighting. Yet the Panchia is a paradise of sorts. Small fields of wheat and barley ripen in the late summer sun. 
The valley floor is lush because ancient canals bring water from the side valleys for irrigation. Life has changed little despite the recent wars. The crops are still gathered by hand, threshed and winnowed, as they have been for thousands of years. In stark contrast to the timeless work of the seasons, Russian tanks lie scattered in the fields, the legacy of three failed attempts by the Russians in the 1980s to capture the valley. This man, Ahmed Shah Massoud and his small band of Mujahideen, kept out the Russians and after them the Taliban. The Panjshir has proved to be a graveyard for military ambition. Massoud had a vision for his beloved country. Afghanistan's future is good. It has natural resources like gemstones and its position is strategically important. Afghanistan will have a bright future. Massoud never lived to see his hopes realized. He was killed by a suicide bomber shortly after this interview. Ahmed Shah Massoud was Gary's friend. Together they planned to bring some prosperity to these people. Gary continues their work to help the people help themselves and their country. That night, Gary and Kudai stay with friends in the village of Kenj. They're treated to the renowned hospitality of Afghan people. Gary's friends are miners and he's come to see the emerald mines that lie high in a valley near the village. Gary is working to improve the mining techniques here and plans are discussed for tomorrow's long hike up to the mines. How many people will be working up here today? Today, many people are working on our radio. The rusted tanks in the valley are not the only legacy of the Russian invasion. The hillsides are still scarred from the many bombs dropped by Russian planes. This is a Soviet bomb, obviously unexploded uh, during the war, probably 1985 to 1988. They were dropping many of these in this area. When they exploded, it would end up with about a 15 foot diameter hole. And many of the miners would find emerald crystals in that pocket or hole that it dug. If that didn't happen and it didn't go off like this one, they would take the powder out of it and use that for their explosives in the mines. They had to be very careful, and a couple people actually went to heaven this way by the bombs exploding, so it was quite dangerous. The miners have a nasty habit of setting off explosives with little or no warning, which adds a frisson to the exhausting climb. The hillside is honeycombed with mine shafts. The tunnels follow the veins of emerald bearing rocks into the mountainside. Each mine is independently owned and the miners set off their explosives whenever they wish. There's only the most basic communication with other miners. With no warning of explosions, entering a mine can have its dangers. Is the vein, is the vein in this line? Yeah. Good? Yeah. Yeah. The miners still use powder gathered from unexploded Russian bombs. Sadly, men do get injured, and many emeralds are smashed to smithereens by the overzealous use of explosives. Yeah, the vein is here. Oh, 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 the vein is here
A green stain marks the emerald bearing rock. By tracing this back into the hillside, the miners know where to set their explosive charges. One of Gary's goals is to train the miners to work more safely, to use less explosive, and to use longer fuses. But Afghan men can be very independent and stubborn. The result of all the explosions can be stunning. Large, raw emerald crystals. Gary buys the miner's emeralds and sells them in the West. In his dealings, Gary is continuing the long tradition started by the ancient lapis lazuli traders. We're now leaving Panjshir Valley to go back up over Anjuman Pass to Escarza, where we left our horses. Inshallah, they're rested, and then we're off to the lapis mines. This is the last stage of the long journey. The trusted Toyota takes Gary and Kudai to Escarza. From there, progress is by horse to Sarasang and the lapis mine. The final days are through the formidable valley of the Kocha. This always gets my heart pumping when I come back here again and visit the Lapis Mines. We're now at the entrance of the Kocha Valley, and I'll get to see the miners who are really nice people. I mean, they're always excited to see you, serve you lunch, and everything you can do. That They like to take you up in the tunnels. The Afghan people in general are pretty much like that. Yesterday, a man brought apricots from his own place. A man I'd never met before came down from his home and served us a big bowl of them. So uh, not only do we have beautiful country, we've got some really nice people here. The landscape has become more extreme. There is little vegetation. The mountains grow higher and steeper. For thousands of years, caravans of donkeys brought Lapis along this trail from the mines on the start of the long journey to Egypt. the mine is sighted. After weeks of travel, Gary and Kudai race the last mile. Finally, the ancient lapis mines. You can see the trailings here going for about a mile. They're very high up the ridge. But before I'm going to climb into any of these tunnels, I certainly want to take a rest in the village over here. So high are the lapis mines that they remain locked in snow and ice for most of the year. The miners can only work in the summer. Over the centuries, the miners have built a village on the far side of the powerful Kocha River. Gary and Kudai have the rest of the day to relax. Tomorrow, they face the formidable climb to the ancient mines. That night, Gary and Kudai's horsemen join the miners to celebrate and sing traditional songs. Their job is done.
کنین آی در گوشه یک مانزه آی ندرفی از رایل شو دست میمانم آی ندرفی از رایل که جان میتی لبت the horses will rest tomorrow. The path to the mine is too steep and narrow. The only way to the mine of the pharaohs is on foot. For Gary, lapis lazuli still holds many mysteries, and the following morning finds Gary wondering about the history of this most ancient of gemstones. Was there a curious individual who ventured up the steep slopes, following the line of rubble, to find where the stone had fallen from? Did someone walk along the river wondering at the beauty of the water-polished blue stones? Was that how the source was found? We'll never know. It happened so long ago. The moment of contemplation over, it's time to climb to the mine of the pharaohs. The climb is the hardest and most dangerous yet. In places, the path is only inches wide as it zigzags back and forth across the precipitous rock walls that guard the mine. few men working. Many have gone to fight in the civil war against the Taliban. Those that remain welcome Gary and Kudai and lead them into the caverns. There are many passages inside the mine. The oldest goes deep into the mountainside for over half a kilometer. The caverns are stained with soot, the result of thousands of years of work. An army of ghosts inhabits these passages. The lapis lazuli was mined by hand brushwood was hauled up the slopes and fires lit against the rock. Cold water caused the hot rock to crack and release its precious blue stone. The unwanted rock was carried out from deep within the mine. Just as it has for centuries, the back-breaking labor continues today. The mile-long streak of rubble marks thousands of years of human effort to extract the precious blue stone of the pharaohs. For Gary, the end of the journey is near.
there's a vein, a vein of rich blue lapis lazuli. The mine is so remote, so difficult to reach, and so hard to work, that it will remain, for all intents and purposes, timeless. As much a part of the world of the pharaohs as of today. Perhaps it's best that way, for Lapis was sacred, and it should remain precious, almost unattainable, except for the most intrepid and daring. The future of Afghanistan is uncertain. Gary's work with gemstones may help. Whatever the future, Gary will return to this enchanting country.